The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the Engine Room Unpacked. I'm Sue Viscovich from Alexa Consulting and I'm thrilled that I get to join your host, Andrew Rocks, to unpack the last five episodes and explore some of the nuggets of absolute gold, brilliant ideas and strategies that you too can deploy to enjoy greater success from your engine room. Let's go. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Unpacked. Today, yet again, um, joining me literally and physically um, at the desk, a little <laughs> yay there, is Sue Biskovich. How are you, Sue? I'm fabulous. Thanks, Roxy. Nice to actually see you in human form. Yeah, like, I mean, when you're doing an unboxing video, it's sort of the virtual unboxing really doesn't do it. But look, I'm really excited, um, as always, for our, our five practices. And part of the reason is there's just a genuinely a, – very varied types of businesses. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I'm looking at the five, which I'm about to list off because uh-huh. it was remiss of me to take a few minutes and <laughs> but last time, but I'm looking at the practices and they're all kind of awesome in their own way and there's very little overlap and maybe, just maybe, that's the new normal. Because people have got more hyper specialized in what they're offering and the, the target market they're, they're sort of getting to. And, and, and I suppose it's also a function of just the industry just maturing. Mm-hmm. But without any further ado, I will, for the listeners out there, run through the five quality practices that we're unpacking today. The first practice is, uh, Gil Gordon, who's the CEO of RI Newcastle and Lower Hunter. He has a fantastic team. We had the privilege of going up to his lovely 150-year-old Maitland residence. Yeah. It was a good one, wasn't it, uh, Kieran the Sound Guy? Nice, fun time. Um, the next one was also another Newcastle business, and we were treated like royalty um, up there at well, the Newcastle hang on, Club. hang on. You might have been. It didn't sound like uh, Kieran the Sound Guy was treated like royalty. We bought Kieran a shirt for <laughs> Kyle for next time, big guy. So um, and that's with Glenn Reilly from from the Fitz business up there. Um, then we had a an unusual one. Um uh, not only are our sponsors, uh, the good people at Zurich, um, uh, in insurance, obviously. And I've been asking a lot of people about insurance and, and, and their comments have been varied and some are r- really into it, but some of them are sort of just trying to figure out, you know, how you can drive that cost of serve down. So I was introduced and met a chap called Brett Wright, who has a business with his father in life insurance for many, many years. And he built, a piece of technology, which we'll talk about in a second, called mm-hmm. LifeBid, yeah. um, which is which is coming to market and supported by some of the industry best. Um, then, just as a, a complimentary, but sort of mixing it up, was uh, Drew Burden from MBS Insurance. They've got a really significant business, and it's um, uh, the way in which they articulate their place in the ecosystem of financial planners is probably the a good take out there. And then uh, to round out the five, I have Hugh Robertson. Um, from Centure on the Gold Coast, who just has a great all-round approach to financial planning. And since we recorded his podcast was, I believe, and he's probably going to listen, number 38 in the Barons list. So a uh, shout out to oh, that's Hugh awesome. as well. So with that in mind, Sue, what jumped out for you? Well, it's interesting because you say that they're such disparate businesses and, and they're all doing really different things and you're absolutely right. And there are definitely some themes that were were playing through this. So I thought I would uh, package up three different kind of themes for us to play with. Um, the first one 
is sharing the love and and this actually I've kind of taken a little bit of liberty with this one it kind of goes a long way but it's sharing the love around critical numbers sharing the numbers with the team and the EBIT and the business metrics you're obviously a very romantic person very <laughs> uh, but the good part about that is often also sharing equity and bonuses linked to performance so I want to talk about that but also sharing problems and sharing challenges there's definitely a, uh, a common theme through all of these with that second uh, theme we're going to flow through is is the power of process. Uh, we talk about this all the time and there's some really, really great examples in these firms about absolutely nailing down their processes and their operations for efficiencies and better client service. And the third one, which is always my favorite, is the client engagement piece. Um, so a couple of the firms are, are using some great techniques to actually create that client engagement and the client experience. And look, I'm going to, I suppose, um, kick off with, with sharing the love. And and uh, it's 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 funny, you know. We talk about putting the client first, but um, you know, our, that's our last topic because, in many respects, if if you can't make the people or help the people who help the clients happy, well, you're going to not really be able to get the last bit right. So, yeah. so what do you mean by sharing love? And maybe uh, a parlay into you know an example from one of the five that you mm. thought um, sort of stood out for that reason. Yeah, for sure. So I think this first part is is around the sharing with your team members. So um, quite a number of these firms had explained how they uh, their employees have equity in the business, uh, that they share the important facts about the business. So it's no longer, and we see this a lot in firms, right? It's no longer, we're the boss, we run the business, you just do what you're told. At the end of the day, financial advice you don't have warehouses of widgets and you don't have stock. What you have to deliver to your clients is in your human capital. So you've got to have great people around you. And in actual fact, um, I think it was, who was it? Drew. I love the quote that he talked about and I wrote this down here and, and I love how he said it was an American guy from, uh, but he said this quote really struck a chord with him. If you're growing a business, the one thing that he would recommend is that if let's say you've got a role that requires someone for a hundred thousand dollars salary, Salary, go find someone that's worth 150k, pay them 150k, and back them to cover that spread. I love that, and so that that really inspired him to make sure that he found great people, paid them well, supported them well, and then enabled them to deliver great outcomes for the business. And you know what? Um, because most of the the practices have, have grown, started small and grown up. That's just a, such a confronting thing because, you know, most of the time they're ambitious and they've just got enough capital to pay the next person. Mm -hmm. um, and they're probably thinking about, well, if I start them at this and they do a good job, I'll pay them more. Whereas kind of what Drew insinuated is just bring forward that three or four years. Yeah. Just find the good ones. They're probably good somewhere else mm. and target it. Yeah. Yeah, back at it and then they'll help you grow it and then also share what's going on in the business so they're motivated by the right kind of things. So I might actually ask us to throw to a quote from Hugh in this spot. It took us a long time to get to this spot. We Everyone kind of thinks about the business development, how to get more referral sources, how to get you know, more leads and all of that. And I've kind of flipped it on its head a little bit in my own thinking and thought, if I can just get the best people and be the most important resource, so we need someone who's going to manage, manage that and their, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations and, and really build out their capabilities. So can't afford three second pit stops. Can't, you cannot afford. And if you're doing three second pit stops, your other three guys who are doing one second pit stops will leave. So that's, probably been our evolution that we can't have you know we talk about eight players and at Central we want to really just be them the number one the desirable spot for the A players now an A player is going to have to do a lot more work um, but they're going to be working in an autonomous environment they're going to be self-directed they're going to take accountability so our evolution has been that if we can get those guys and not have the C's or even you know you look at I know you're a fan of scaling up as I am and, you know, that if we've got that attitude and those core values right on, on one, one axis and on the, on the across axis, you know, the X axis, the performance, we really want those guys that are doing the high performance and high values. But if we have to choose between a performance or values, we'll always choose values because we can train the performance. We can teach people coach. You know what? At the time when Hugh did that anecdote, I, I just had a, a big smirk on my face and, you know, you're only as 
sort of you're only as fast as the slowest person. Yeah. And um, you know, whether you're rowing a boat or, or, or you know, a pit stop, which is what the, the reference was there. Yeah. And I think that that's um sometimes businesses don't want to address the awkward conversations mm. and sometimes businesses aren't really sort of set up for there. But what did you take out of that particular quote? Well, you know, I, I love the, this fact about having great people but then also rewarding the right way for the right things. And I actually put a post up on LinkedIn this week. I've seen a, and I hear it all the time about this, um, you know, the cost of delivering services is increasing but particularly uh, people complaining or getting really um, uh, frustrated by the fact that the cost of wages is going up. And there was an article that came out this week around, uh, you know, there were some firms finding, I mean, we know it's hard to find great advices in the market, but that they were seeing people offer things like 50 grand increases and paying people so much. And and I kind of look at it maybe through a different lens. And that is to say, look, we are a profession now, right? All of your advisors, they've done their studies. They continue to do good studies. You are only as good as the people that are sitting in front of your clients, you know, that you've got to make sure you're getting quality people delivering quality services. So rather than worried about the fact that they've got to keep earning more and you've got to keep paying them more, that's just a business function. You want to pay them well to get the best people. And that's not the only reason people come to you. But build your business in a way that then you can afford to pay them and still generate healthy profits and sustainable profits. This is not just about making more money, but it's building this long-term sustainable business. And so I know, you know, if you look at that, it's also about sharing uh, other parts of the love. So Gil Gordon, um, he has advisors owning equity. He's also got AZNGA in there. So he's owning the equity with this equity partner, which we're going to talk about. I know Glenn um, is part owned with uh, Fitzpatrick. Uh, Brett, you know, he's raising capital and we're going to come back to Brett, but that's all about also getting well, at, people At the time of this podcast, love. he has raised capital. Congratulations. That's correct, yeah. Um, and Drew at MBS, you know, he has both uh, advisors owning equity and Merchant, who's an equi- uh, external partner. All of this with the exception of Hugh in that group of five, and yet he also said that he is going to, going to be bringing in capital and his people are going to be buying in. So I think the thing around this is you really do not have to do it alone. There are ways to access capital um, and there's also ways to access expertise as well to support you in your business. Um, but I think if we come back to the sharing the love with the team and rewarding the right things, there's a great book. In fact, I'm not even sure if I mentioned this last time. Um the Great Game of Business. In fact, Dave Carney from VBP put me onto this. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I'm part of the cult. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, um, it's confronting at first because you're sharing every single line of your P&L with yeah. every single member of your team. Yeah, yeah. But, but it works. Yes. And what was fascinating about this, like we do it with our coaching clients all the time. We're often, you know, we're sharing the critical numbers and what the critical numbers are depends on the individual business. It is usually the money numbers, but there's also other important numbers within the business as well. I think Glenn spoke something about that. What did Glenn mention? He did. So he talked about sharing the revenue and the EBIT with the advisors. Um, so they have, I think he was saying their advisors have a four-year EBIT bonus. So their focus is not just making sales then. It's not about top line. They understand what's happening. They understand the profitability. They're building sustainable business practices. They're working as a team. So it, it's it's this – they're thinking like a business owner even before they become part of the equity participation plan. And that is then what helps you build a sustainable business. You know, I know it's almost full – it's not almost full circle is what I was wanting to say there. I mean, in fact, one, who was it? One of them in the, um, in the five were actually talking at some point about when they very first started, they were part of the banks. And so it was all about sales, sales, sales. This is not full circle back to those days. This is about saying, bring people into the tent, share what's going on in the business so they can be rewarded for great business practices. Cause let's face it, if you've got a sustainable, profitable business, it also means that you're delivering great outcomes to your clients because you can't have one and not the other. Um, But it is really important that you then choose the numbers that you are going to reward people on. And in fact, Drew is the quote that I want to share from here because it doesn't always have to be about the financial numbers. So what did Drew have to say? We expect that they will have a certain level of activity. So we don't look at dollars. We look at the number of lives 
insured. Yeah. So we're not seeking for them to hit, you know, to because they'll prioritize then a bigger case over a smaller case in terms of dollars when to the accounting firm or the wealth firm, that might be a key client that only needs a small amount of cover. And so we can't have them persuade or, or consciously or subconsciously driven to write bigger policies. What we need to see is activity. So we, we, we want to insure people. Yeah, that, that that sounds really powerful. What what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you if you're linking people's financial reward, but also their KPIs, potentially their bonuses, if you're linking that to productivity, and I think you know if you're rewarding the right behaviours, then people are going to be doing the right thing by the business. I mean, you get good people, so you, they're going to do the right thing by the client anyway, regardless. You've got the same values, but then you reward them for the things that help you grow sustainably. And and I would even look, you know, we we see in firms sometimes that it's it's can be complicated to create a, a revenue structure for the advisors. But then sometimes people are saying to me, it's really complicated to then figure out how to reward my support team. And so if we're doing KPIs for people in the support team, then those critical numbers might be around turnaround times. You know, if it's your power planners, it might be around the quality of the documents and the the, um, the error rate and making sure that that stayed really tight. And look, one of the things that I've seen – it, which is not, it, it is an emerging trend, to be honest, but probably always should have been there is, is, is having, um, equity, not just in the client facing advisors. Yeah. I, I think that the, the 20 or so years of doing that really hamstrung them when they wanted to have succession planning anyway. Yeah. Um, and because the incoming buyer didn't have the buy in of the rest of the business. Um, from memory, and I think about one of the, the, the probably the largest, um, practice that we spoke with as far as advisor numbers which is you know if you put your stereotype on which would mean the most amount of people who aren't shareholders would have been mbs but Mm. um from memory i think um there's a quote there around their shared value in the business there is indeed so we'll we'll come back this is drew i know we'll we'll come back to his voice again um but let's have a listen about this and i know there's lots of you in here too roxy so people are going to get really confused about they're listening to roxy now or listening to roxy and drew's conversation but i don't care because have have you seen the movie inception (laughs) (laughs) hopefully it goes faster (laughs) not slower when you go in (laughs) so this one i think we're actually going to start out with you talking roxy so let's bring in you and and drew can i throw them in Equity. And for those okay. still awake, I'll put you to sleep. Over to you, Andrew. <laughs> and so so then if you've if you've got those three sixty feedbacks, yeah. after a period of time then then um you know what what's the methodology? Is it is it um synthesized equity, is it ESOP, is it actual equity? What 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 does what does the MBS playbook look like if you don't mind me asking? It's actual equity. So they would um they would set up a perhaps you know, more commonly a family trust and they would borrow the buy in. Yeah, okay. And so how, that, how many shareholders do you say so you've got 55 team members and some of them would be recent hires and some yep. have been there forever. What's the shareholder f- footprint look like? Yeah. Sorry, one last comment to that. And we would guarantee the debt because for a younger person, you know, maybe in their 30s or maybe in their 40s that, that might have young children, might have a, a mortgage or maybe they're looking to, to buy a So home. you're not crimping their borrowing capacity to buy a house, Our basically. Prefer- yeah, correct. Yeah. We want to support it. Yeah. Um, so, and you're also backing your own business. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And the business also, you know, it needs to be a worthwhile investment for them as well. Yep. So we'll be transparent with them, you know, not just, you know, just in time in the days or weeks before uh, they're offered the opportunity to, to, to buy in, but we will want them to have full comprehensive knowledge of the business financials and the investment they're making in the business um, from that perspective and the opportunity to talk to their accountants and have their accountants engage with our accountants. So there's a level absolutely. of transparency on the, on yeah. the P&L and, and, and where you guys are going. But, you yeah. know, given the nature of your business, most of them who have a calculator can probably work it out to a certain extent. So um, I imagine they'd be quite enthusiastic given that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, 10 shareholders yep. um, currently and we also have bought on a capital partner, a US group called yep. Merchant, which have assisted in in strengthening our balance sheet. Um, so what that means is they've they've taken care of Macquarie's debt for the moment um, and given us the opportunity for a bit of a reset moment. So again, you know, none of the existing shareholders wanted to take money off the table or wanted to sell down, but what we wanted to do was strengthen 
our balance sheet for what we see is the next the next run of growth and, and investment and reinvestment. You know, we need to reinvest in our policies, in our tech stack, in our processes, in our talent. And we do believe um, in acquired growth and organic growth working together. And I believe that, that, that what we just mentioned there with, with the um, capital partner of Merchant, um, there are a lot of other capital partners out there and, and, yep. and, and um, uh, it, it really is the growing up of this industry. Yeah. You know, it's been wild that, that businesses um, in financial services haven't had, um, you know, capital partners because at the end of the day, there's only a couple of ways to grow and that's debt um, or, or, or borrowings or, or, or equity. And there's only so much equity that can come from internal people. So yeah. um, I think that's a pretty shrewd move. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give you the firepower to be able to actually do that inorganic growth um, as well as, you know, give you the ability to weather any storms that, that – Potentially could be in the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. And they, um, and they were the right fit for us for a couple of reasons. You know, um, the two obvious ones were, you know, they've come in at nineteen point nine percent ownership. Yep. But what they have done as well is, you know, that they've they've filled that brief because we have sort of a ten to fifteen year plan and vision. Yep. None of us are sort of looking to to exit out in the shorter term, and so. Um, we would have been very hesitant to do any any sort of uh, bring in any capital partner for a, a more material amount than than twenty percent or under, under that. Yeah, the great irony with um, what Drew mentioned was that uh, after he mentioned that they uh, took on a capital partner, I very hurriedly <laughs> made a phone call to said capital partner saying, <laughs> "Not sure you're aware that one of your people have just done a potential press release." Um, <laughs> but as it turns out, and as many of you who follow the the, the series. Um, uh, David Haynes from Merchant um, uh, has come into Australia. Their capital partners get a particular type of of uh, target, and um, you can learn more about that if you listen to his podcast. That's right. Um, and what it uh, then cascades is that a lot of the people who are your engine room of your engine room are in their thirties and forties. Mm. Now it uh, coincides with that period in your life where. You have a dirty big home loan. You may or may not have kids. Um, uh, both of them are expensive. For you might want to educate sure them. Are. So, so yeah. So it's kind of uh, the businesses have to really get creative in how they can manufacture meaningful avenues mm. for non-foundation shareholders yep. to share in the game. Yeah, that's right. And and you know, this is we're really seeing this proliferation of of opportunities here for firms there's there's so well so many there's there's a significant number of equity partners in the market now um so it is it does mean that access to capital is easier nowadays but we're also seeing a lot more esop so employee share ownership plans um and sometimes it's around having the right growth partner to help you do that because it you know we know that great businesses are built off relationships, not only, to your point earlier, not only with the advisor and certainly we're encouraging firms to make sure that it's a team serviced approach, not just relationship between client and advisor. So when you've got great practice managers, when you've got great, you know, career client service managers, you'd love for them to stick around for the long term. And, you know, when I talk to these business owners who are doing this, they also want to reward them more than purely just by salary. You know, they, they should be able to, to get some of the capital upside of this fantastic business that they're building. So I think it's really interesting because I, I remember not that long ago and, you know, I've been around it a little while, but uh, it wasn't really that long ago that people were starting to worry about, I'm building this really big business. I'm going to get to the point where I'm too big for anyone to have the money to buy me. Well, that's certainly not the case anymore. You've or it got- used to be actually that the only people who could buy me was a bank, which yeah. is kind of the exact opposite of the philosophy that I built my yeah, business exactly. on and my clients. So, so yeah. you, you kind of you did feel that that was possibly um, the case, and I, yeah. I think there was probably five or six years in the wilderness. Mm. Um, well, I remember talking to advisors saying to me, "Now that the banks are out, who's going to buy my business? Because I'm get, we're just going to the only option is to list." And well, no. Then- to be clear. Who's going to buy my recurring income of my well, client base as opposed to a business? Yeah. And then when they started thinking of it as a business, yeah. the great irony is, guess what investment advisors do all day? Mm-hmm. They identify investment opportunities for their clients, sustainable earnings, barrier to entry, um, government regulations, 
Which is exactly what financial planners are. Exactly. And so they are great businesses, great profitable businesses. So you, it's no wonder you have this interest in, in equity partners coming in. So, um, you know, that example was with Merchant. And I know our, our previous one, um, uh, or the next one we're going to turn to is AZNGA. So Gil uh, from RI Newcastle. And I think it was only in about the last year that he actually brought AZ in. So, yes, um, these groups. And look, there's quite a few, a number of licensees are purchasing uh, equity in firms now. You've got uh, Broadleaf and they all have different propositions of what they bring to the table. Yeah. And look, um, Gil uh, already had some employee share. He like, did, yeah. uh, And in fact, if when I say employee, he would not frame them as those. They're his business partners. They're yeah. long-term partners of his. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's the languaging that, 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 that most of the people would, would use. I think that's right. I think when you say ESOP, they're probably, what's a partner SOP? POS? Okay. Pos, pos, we'll come back. Pos, we'll workshop no, that later. That. Sound guy. <laughs> um, so yeah, it'd be great to, um, you know, get a, a vibe for Gil. Plus, yeah. Gil has been around for a while, yeah. but like I've found with a cohort of advisors that have been um, doing this for a long time, they're still open to new ideas yes. and new adventures. Yes, and that is the key, right? So I think, you know, for Gil, it wasn't just access to the capital, but the business intelligence, the emotional, the psychological support. Um, so, yeah, let, let's just throw to him and hear Gil talk about it. Well, we're, we're happily part of the AZNGA family. So we do have a board of advice or a board, governance board, meets every three months and that's wonderful. I love it and it terrifies me because um, these guys are smart. Let's talk about what they're doing for you to keep you on the straight and narrow every quarter. So obviously we have very good board reports and, you know, financials. Is this the first time you've had to report to someone other than yourself? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And that was challenge. Uh, He's yeah. clenching his fist here for everyone yeah. who's not getting the visuals. <laughs> Just joking. No, Fitzy, Brian Fitz talks about it. That there are there are people that are accountable and people that are responsible. Think of it as a football player. Give me the ball. Trust me, I know what I'm doing with the ball. Monday morning quarterback me, that's something that I've had to learn how to do. Learn how to actually be accountable for my decisions. They couldn't be more supportive. These guys are very experienced. Graham used to run Count Plus and Paul Barrett obviously has been around the industry forever. But they ask the right questions. I've never found them anything other than supportive. They've got a great team behind me, behind us that help us with M&A opportunities that help us with uh, business model sort of stuff, hiring, um, recruitment marketing they've done a huge amount for us what they haven't done is interfere you know they, they they're not in here telling us how to do this or that they're uh, they're a great partner because they they ask us to have a plan and then we explain the plan and then they back us when we implement it and it's been it's been a very good relationship as well as creating and this is a big thing as well as creating a succession plan for the business so they've got the money and they're helping us with, you know, acquisitions and things like that. But they also create the employee share plan where the uh, the, the smaller partners and the senior people in the business have got a, a, an equity participation plan, which is terrific. Yeah, one of the most fun questions I get to ask in this series is when when an entrepreneur has grown their business and they've been the boss for years and years and then they <laughs> they then scale up which is great and they get a level of maturity and all of a sudden they've got to report to someone mm -hmm. um or not someone but um, they're reporting to themselves right they but but it just brings rigor yeah to the business yeah. ironically it's kind of what Elixir consulting does by proxy for many of your clients yeah, anyway right. yeah yep. but without the overwhelming threat yeah. of, 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 of an ownership intervention maybe that might be your future model sue you know to get some of these people to what what would i say i used to say that financial planning was getting people to do things they know they should do in a time frame they otherwise wouldn't right so potentially Getting financial planning practices to do things they know they should do, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah, but and and look, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, I know you, you, you're joking about it, but it's absolutely right because once a firm has a, a rigorous process to say, no, we are coming back to the table, we are looking at our figures every month. I know in that example they have quarterly board meetings, but once you've got this operating rhythm of knowing what your critical numbers are and reflecting back on them on a regular basis – 
the fact of doing that, whether it be your coach or whether it be um, reporting back to your board, it means that you as that entrepreneur or principal has to stop and think about what are those numbers telling you and that it informs your decisions and then it means that you get such faster progress because you're not just coasting along and then looking back a year later going, oh, look what happened there. Absolutely. And I'd like to say the engineering podcast was the first time there was collaboration between people to solve challenges or to partner. Mm. Um, but the best thing that I've seen in financial planning industry in the last little while is peer to peer learning and mm. helping each other. Yes. Um, you know, when I look across at a couple of the businesses here, um, and if I look back at a lot of the, the questions, um, life insurance has been, 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 been a very well loved mm. part of the ecosystem, yeah. but due to reasons that are well documented and, mm-hmm. and, um, has been a hard cost to serve. Yeah. But did you see, did you see any sort of partnerships forming that you, you jumped out at you to solve problems with each other? Yeah. Well, for sure. I mean, the obvious one, um, is, is looking at, uh, life bid and we're going to get to that in just a second. But I think this is around um, specialization. And, you know, you're absolutely right. I think one of the, the biggest frustrations, the biggest, most difficult parts of the market right now is life insurance. Um, and uh, we know that financial advice- Sorry, are you saying that based on the last five episodes or you're saying that based on your length and breadth of, <laughs> of experience? Both. Okay. Uh, this is a key challenge that is faced by the industry. And what is really frightening is that we are still hearing advisors saying life insurance has just got too hard. We're just not doing it anymore. And we're saying that's not right unless you've got completely self-insured clients or, you know, they're already in retirement. If you've got any wealth creators, you cannot afford to just pay lip service to it or just go, it's too hard, which is why, thankfully, there are some great alternatives for people in the market now. And this is part of this theory of specialization. Um, you know, and we're not just saying, I mean, I do want to spend some time talking now about those challenges in life insurance, but I also know we're not just seeing it in, in that risk space. You know, there's great, um, alternatives for people having and in fact you know Gil and a couple of them have relationships with estate planning lawyers they make sure that their their estate plans are sorted for their clients and they get the specialists in the lending aspect is really good and you probably can't say this Roxy but I will I know you've actually built out your Lydian mortgage services to be able to do exactly that people Financial advisors have the relationship and the knowledge of the client. They know they could be doing better maybe on their home loan or their lending or they need a specialist to support with that. They don't necessarily have the skill set or the bandwidth or the scale to do it in-house, but there are ways to do it through partnerships. And if, if I come back to that insurance space, you know, it's, it's, it's been decimated, really. It's the only way to, to, to talk about it. Um, and I guess as Drew said, and I actually wrote down this quote. Is this the, 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 10 negative things? Oh, no, 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 15, Roxy. <laughs> he said when you get 15 consecutive negative points of regulatory intervention for life insurance advice, practice distribution falls off a cliff, and that's exactly That's Drew's happened. very eloquent way yes, of saying they keep effing it up. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and I think you use the words as being a perfect storm, and it has, you know, between reduction in insurance commissions, between the difficulties of underwriting, between the process steps, between the education piece and not enough, you know, so many risk advisors have left the profession. It's difficult. And the actual process of getting life insurance in place, and, of course, the other thing too, right, is people have got risk insurance books and they have clients, if they're if – they're, Insurance as part of their financial plan, it's fine because they're reviewing the client circumstances. They're generally paying a fee as well. They can afford to make sure those services are looked after. But if they've got a risk-only book and they're only getting a small trail from it, there are really big decisions happening around the country um, in advice practices every day at the moment because they've got a book. They know they need to be servicing it. They can't sit back passively anymore. But if you reach out to 10 of those clients and three of them say, actually, I need to reduce my level of cover because it's got too expensive, you've got to do the work and then the client's reducing their levels of cover so you're reducing your cost. So you have to figure out how to charge for it uh, or for many of them it gets too hard and if you can't systemize, if you don't have the bandwidth or the energy or the scale, there are other options to making sure that you can take care of the, the needs for your clients. So thankfully now you can um, refer it out. You could sell your risk book and then refer your future clients back to the successor or you could do a joint venture. So 
This is actually the second risk specialist firm. I think the last time we unpacked um, your interview with uh, Ben and Sean from Ausbrokers. Yep. Uh, and, of course, this this set of five had yep. Drew in there from MBS. So I thought he made some really interesting points, not only about the process of delivering risk advice, but also this specialist expertise too. Absolutely. And um, we might take a quote from, from Drew on that specialisation because I'm going to back announce the quote with, with a, a conversation I've had subsequently with, with one of the largest um, providers of financial advice in the United States. So first of all, let's hear from Drew. We absolutely see specialization. We see the need. I've already addressed that. The need continuing. So we think the market is going to grow, but it won't grow quickly. It won't grow quickly from ARs writing insurance. We had, I had a look at the, the most recent June quarter uh, AFSL data, so the productivity per AR, and it's tiny. You know, the top 20 AFSLs in distributions, you know, most were distributing 10 grand in life insurance premium for the quarter per AR. There's nothing. So there's this long, long tail. Um, Insurance companies and technology hopefully will help those who are doing part-time life insurance advice increase. But the true growth, Roxy, will come from specialists. And the reason being, if you're a wealth advisor, you, you may be seeing your clients once or twice or three times a year. So your capacity is limited. Whereas if you're a specialist risk advisor, you have a much greater capacity. You know, if you are providing a really comprehensive quality high portfolio, then maybe you're making adjustments every two, three, four years, particularly if you've got a more stable premium environment, right? So it's touching base, but it's not the same depth of of, uh, meeting and advice process that the wealth advisor would have. So, um, But even within within advice, People are now getting hyper-specialized into industries that their clients are coming from, for instance. So I just think it's a growing up of the industry. And I think that, you know, being able to service, you know, one size fits all is pretty tough. And yeah. and, and, and look, the, the platform of that is, is the case. But Well, I just don't think you – sorry to interrupt you. I just – I don't believe that you can do as good a job as someone for your client. You might be able to do a portfolio structure that is excellent and, and on point – but how can you be adequately across the wealth creation and the wealth protection equally, right? If you invested all of your time in the wealth creation component of the business, then surely you're going to be better at that than if you spread yourself across multiple disciplines and you're dealing with different stakeholders. So if you have got the specialization, you've got the ability to deliver those services within your practice, that is fantastic. Whether that be someone that has got the time uh, to be able to devote to continually updating their knowledge on risk, whether you have a risk specialist sitting inside your firm or doing something like, you know, bringing in an MBS like Drew, you know, whatever happens, insurance advice is just too important to ignore. Absolutely. And look, the theme of coming together is, is, is not just in the horizontals, which you've mentioned, where one particular practice might, for instance, uh, outsource their investment management committee. They might outsource their, 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 their debt advice. They might outsource their insurance. But the coming together is also in the verticals. And, and what Brett, Right brought to the table. And mm. apart from a, you know, a great lineage of a risk only uh, business with, with his father and doing a lot of like buy sells and a lot of that kind of more strategic risk. Um, he just identified that like everyone, um, that the cost to serve was going to really, really be a, a struggle, especially when you've got an artificial cap on how much you can earn, yes. which, um, yet again, I think was a perfect storm was the reference. Um, let's quickly throw to the perfect storm just for those playing at home and we'll come back. Yeah, look, and it was a perfect storm. And for those, um, uh, for those who are new to the game, the, the LIF, um, sort of framework reduced the commissions to 60%, um, for upfront down from what everyone was typically taking around 80%, um, on a hybrid. And it was that extra 20%, which really, um, uh, was probably the, the wriggle room if you were slightly inefficient. But now there's nowhere to hide, is there, in the engine room for life insurance businesses? No, no, there's not. And, um, and you might think going from 80 to 60, oh, that's not that significant, but the actual work around the compliance piece, so the advice process and the documentation and SOAs started you know, ballooning out and um, 
And so when when you cut that revenue and you add the complexity in the advice process with the compliance, um, it you know becomes unviable. And most of and you know that's where we've seen a lot of advisors say, "I'm just not going to offer life insurance advice anymore," um, or "I'm not going to see new clients and just service my existing clients." And um, you know it's quite it's quite alarming. Yeah, you know, out of the sixteen thousand advisors in, in the in the industry, I think it's seventeen hundred, right? 75% of the industry's new business and I think you know to quote an advisor ratings report from earlier this year there's 150 risk specialists left yeah so the the stimulation or the you know why we founded it was just immense frustration frustrated by how complex and expensive it had become for you know consumers to access the advice that they need and the products that they need um, and then equally as frustrated by how you know risky and time consuming and unprofitable it become for advisors and licensees and insurers to help people you know protect their families their incomes their businesses as well so um that's where you know we just went right how are we going to fix this industry issue you know no industry stakeholder can solve the problems on their own so that's where we started um that's where we you know formed together the life bid working group so when we're um talking about what life bid has brought to the table um, the reason why I brought this very interesting story to the table was that um, I very quickly worked out that a lot of advisors and a lot of advisory practices were backing this, which is a departure from the way in which institutions had operated. Mm-hmm. They were very much a, a field of dreams. I build the product and the advisors will come. A quick look at the life bid website and I apologies if there's any additional people since the recording of this um, but uh, Osbrokers Life, Australian Unity, Centrepoint Alliance, Fortnum, Synchron and MBS are noted as foundation advice partners. They've put their brand mm. um, on this and it gives me a bit of a segue. I had the, the, the pleasure of meeting with um, Mark Spinkler, who's the uh, CEO of a merchant in uh, globally. Mm. Um, and we're talking a serious business, um, yes. a very big business, and uh, and they're just making inroads into Australia. And so um, when one has a very limited amount of time, um, I wanted to ask questions that I thought I could also leverage into this podcast. <laughs> and so I asked Mark, um, tell me about the uh, role of, of outsourcing um, in the in the RIAs, which is financial planning in America, mm. he said without hesitating, they outsource everything. Mm. Each individual practice becomes hyper specialized at the market and the thing that they're the best at. Right, and they outsource domestically. So if they're if if they're in AFSL land, they'll outsource this task. They'll outsource that. It is very commonly accepted. Um, the clients don't mind. When I go to my doctor, I'm pretty happy that he he or she doesn't say, I can do your heart surgery and fix your knee. Yeah. I want them to outsource. Yeah. So if you have the trust of the client relationship, it's almost expected in a profession mm. for those to be outsourced. But that was very interesting. And what um, I think – the learnings from that is is that the sharing of clients for their best interest, you know, to yes. use a term that's been thrust upon us, um, probably will benefit the the stakeholders. And look, when we talk stakeholders, and we all we've all learnt about our stakeholders having to do these seventy five times the ethics course, <laughs> um, and I'm sure I've got another hundred to go. Um, one of the stakeholders is clearly the clients, but the other stakeholders are the general public and the duty of care we have towards the perception of our industry. Yes, now. It makes no sense that one planner can say that they're the master of the universe. Mm. It doesn't happen in engineering firms. It doesn't happen in other businesses. It's far more saying I'm really, really ridiculously good at this. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got people who are around me who are good at other things. Yeah. See? So, so did you like that theme of share the love? I think it, it's, it has so many applications. <laughs> Absolutely, and what's and so in saying that, what's our what's our next theme? Well, uh, so I had a nice little segue with this one because you know what um, Brett is building is technology and it's bringing people together to fund this creation of a system that's going to make life better. Um, and I should, before I jump to the next one, I know you said before that there is a cap on what you can earn. And, and of course, those who know me know I wrote a book called Worth Paying For, which was about how to make sure that you can build a profitable life insurance advice business. We do know that some advisors are successfully charging fees for their advice 
as well as for insurance advice, whether that be hybrid with comms or not. But we definitely are seeing that that is for those people who can afford the higher premiums, they can afford that fee as well. And it's really that middle market of people, you know, it's hard enough for them to pay a $3,000 life insurance premium. They really need the help. So I'm so glad that we are sharing the love and people are all pitching in to help Brett solve this problem because it's a really important one to solve. Technology is going to solve all sorts of things for us. And in fact, you know, we, we talk about technology as being able to help us drive efficiency, help us keep the cost of advice down and lift the service. And in fact, you know, we're doing some work at the moment around AI and automation and there is some really exciting things coming out to the marketplace. But you cannot leverage tech unless you have good processes. Did you like that segue? So that takes us to our next theme. The power of process. That's right. <laughs> and look, you know, I, I we as coaches are talking about this all the time. You know, you cannot build out um, really robust service models and efficiencies without having process. People need to decide how they're going to do it. It's got to be one way, same way. Um, you know, Drew... Uh, he's systemized to deliver their specialty. All they do is risk advice. So they've built their entire system and engines around doing that. Glenn, you know, he, uh, from, um, Fitzpatrick's, he brought his wife in over a period of time to systemize their business and they run their whole business out of Monday. I love the, the description of how they do that. Um, you know, I, I think when we're talking about this, it's also, it might sound boring, but it's really critical. Uh, and often when we talk about this, we're talking with principals and advisors and they tend to get it from a theoretical perspective. They know how important it is, but they're not the right personalities to sit down and build out that end-to-end system. They're like they would rather eat their foot and it's probably not the best uh, use of their skills. Or time. Or time. Okay. That's and right. so I've just circled the practices and, and – Yet again, and this is a reoccurring theme, every single one of those practices um, through various um, suppliers have leveraged their time Mm -hmm. by working with an outsource partner Mm -hmm. who has freed up their middle office, which quite often would be the person best placed to help you with building your process out. Yes. But historically, it was the last job that they got to every day and didn't. Yes. And they've leveraged that time and they've had their person build a great process, which has then further leveraged their time and they're spiraling up. Exactly. And you know what? Why don't we hear straight from the horse's mouth? I know I know Gil quite well. He's fabulous. He won't mind me calling him a horse in this example. <laughs> Let's hear from Gil with his process. Yeah. Completely. I mean, I signed a new client up yesterday uh, and we introduced the client service team as the people that manage the process. And, you know, a bit of self-deprecating. They don't trust me with matches, that sort of stuff. And I'm not kidding. My daughter, Kate, works for me and Katie has lectured me three times this week about making diary appointments in my own diary. She said, you stuff up the system when you do that. Don't do it. Don't don't even try it, just to send them to us because they have a series of threads that kick off and we lean incredibly heavy into that. And just to, as a number, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, ever since we engage with VBP and one of the great things about VBP is you, you're forced to standardise your handover. So I said to one of our advisors, Steve, a couple of years ago and he picked up a yellow folder, which was a review folder, and I said to him, mate, who, who did that review prep for you? He said, don't know, don't care. And what he meant was, I know what's in it. I know that the quality's there and it really doesn't matter who does it well, for you're me, getting the model team. I'm getting. Yeah. Right? And what we've noticed since we've got that standardization, right, and VBP gets a big shout out for this, that our advisor numbers, our client numbers per advisor have gone up by about 40% and accordingly our revenue per advisor has gone up by about 40%. So basically, we've just been taking on more clients without needing to hire more staff because we simply do more with less time because the system actually works. You know, it's customized to this practice. I'm not saying it'll be perfect for the next guy. I'd, I think it might be good, but what we did was we figured out what, how we wanted to run our business and then we put a system in place and we created massive efficiency and it had a direct impact on the profit and a turnover, and uh, by extension, the value of the business. Yeah, look, and I think I think you'll be the first person to to um, uh, sort of look back on that. And I don't think he realised the impact of freeing up 
his best advisor's time, mm. there was never a motivation or, or client acquisition problem. There was just a time problem. Yeah. And by streamlining it and trusting his people in his office – and other people in other office, and I believe it was VBP, I've just read the notes, mm -hmm. um, uh, he's managed to free up that time yeah. um, and deliver a better outcome. So, and bully I, to him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I think it was Gil that had said it took his advisors from being able to service maybe 120 clients to more like 150, and they're doing exactly that now. So, again, it's, it's not only about efficiencies, it's about building the capacity for the advisors to serve more people. But I think what's really a key theme through all of these firms is it's also about making sure that the outcomes for the clients are better as well. It's not just about making more money. It's delivering a better service to the clients. So we've got to this. We've got to the client. <laughs> Whenever, you know, as a reformed CFP, shout out to the CFPs in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, you always started with the client. But we've done it the other way around because if you don't have the systems and the time and you're not sharing the outcome with your overall team, mm. you're not going to get everyone pushing the same way. Yeah. So now that we've got the time, we can talk about client engagement, you know. Yeah. So so I think everyone, everyone here just genuinely – they, they none of them mentioned they wanted to target efficiencies to put more money in their bank. No. They all mentioned – if they target efficiencies properly, it gives them more time to help their clients more. Yes, that's exactly right. And it means building out that proposition that they're delivering to them, you know, whether it be from, as we talked earlier, that hyper specialization and partnering with the right people to solve the right problems for their clients. Um, but the one that I really want to pull out uh, is that interestingly, even though they're from different uh, groups, both Gil and Glenn use the 10 3 now engagement process. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and it, and it's from Brian Fitzpatrick, you know, and and obviously that's through Fitzpatrick's the licensee. Uh, but I think they, I don't know if they still do, but they certainly used to run training programs. Where even if advisors weren't in their network, they could go and and do the training program. Oh, it's called the Fitz way. I'm I'm sure that they they they. I'm sure that's one of the key pillars of how they attract and retain their team. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, indeed. And and it is it's a beautiful way of taking the conversation away from the dollars and the numbers and. All, you know, that's a theme through all really successful advice practices. We know that they're not just talking about investments and dollars. Uh, it's not just about a fact find. They have a really great way to get to know their clients properly, uh, to have a far deeper proposition for them than purely investment or insurance strategies. And I mean, you know, you know, I love this because I am on the board of Lumiant, uh, and Lumiant is a fantastic system that enables advisors to really extend that conversation not only through the conversation but then capturing that data in the technology and adding to that ongoing um, conversation piece, tracking back to goals, tracking back to people's values. It's so critical. And so what I really loved about this conversation um, that we had, that you had with Gil, is that he'd taken that 10 3 now. And I think within that, there's the four L's. They talk about live, love, learn, and legacy. Um, and of course, as every great financial advisor does, they iterate and they put their own spin on things. And, and I love what Gil did with redesigning it to put people first and using people as that acronym to shape his conversations. And I had to write this down. I don't want to get it wrong, Gil. Um, so uh, P for place, E for employment and career, O for offspring and family, P for passions and hobbies, L for liabilities and E for expenses. So, you know, a great way to really round out what's really important to clients and get to know them. And of course, that means he's got a great conversion rate for uh, his new clients. And of course, he brings that same philosophy into the client review process and it gets fantastic retention. I think, you know, probably uh, really good for our listeners now is to basically hear what the um, uh, the 10-3 the now philosophy really is, you know, because what I like about it is every time you meet with the client kicks off again. Yeah. So um, I believe Glenn probably uh, framed that best. He did indeed. And in actual fact, I know he, he credits Jim Stackpole and I probably um, should have cut this as at a different point in the quote because he was talking about the way that he captures people's whole life in a mind map on one page. Um, and that was, he learned that through Jim and it's a great way of, of particularly dealing with those clients with a lot going on in their life. And he has this really well-structured page to put it all together, way to put it in this mind map. 
And then he brings through this 10-3 now concept. You know what I actually saw him present, at, um, which I, I probably referenced in the, in the in the podcast with him. And as he was doing it, he was showing the mind map. I'm like, I'm I'm looking up there and I'm putting my own family's numbers in his mind yeah, map. Yeah. They're like really engage me. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that would be awesome, right? You know, so uh, yeah. um, never say never, Glenn. Give me a call one day. Who knows? <laughs> I might be able to forge a lofty, lofty uh, sort of aspirations. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's listen to his quote. Yeah. And I've got to give credit to Jim Stackpool for, for this framework that he taught us when he was coaching me. So we want to see their entire life on a page. Um, at the initial meeting, the context is to get really clear about what would make a great life for you as a client. So I want to take you forward 10 years and I want you to paint me that picture. Where are you living? What are you doing? How much income do we need? What are your financial milestones? What do you want to give back? If you weren't here yesterday, what did it all mean? What's your legacy? Um, so they're the kind of things that we want to be understanding and getting really clear about what that looks like and why that's important. We're then going to take you forwards three years from now. What's got to happen for you to be on track for your 10-year milestones in three years. What are some of the milestones that need to happen there? And then in 12 months, what are we got to achieve together in the next 12 months? What kind of plans or advice do we need to provide? So it's execution time. It is for you to nail your 12-month milestones. You know what? Let's just keep listening to, the, you know, to, to Glenn. He's, he's, he articulated the concept of coming to better get together and getting the right people working together and each playing to their strengths might have been his sporting gap background, but he really embraced that, you know, a team philosophy. So, um, you know, how he could service his clients better and scale. So um, let, let's let's hear a bit more of what Keep he's got to say. The, the one thing that's kind of evolved since the Royal Commission is that it's become harder and harder for single man, your one man bands, your smaller practices to offer a profitable service. They need scale. They need... Uh, to leverage their time and let go of some of the the things that they've got to do, like compliance, um, to other people that are better off doing that so they can focus more time on giving advice. So again, if I, I bring you back to our model where I want each of our advisors managing at least a million dollars of revenue, not making the file notes or doing the power planner handovers, the goal is that they can walk in, give advice and walk out. So that model would look like a senior advisor, there might be two associates straddling each meeting, jumping across each meeting, an offshore CSO managing them. In a perfect world, this business, you know, we're generating 30 to 35% EBIT. Um, and that there's no reason why with that model, um, with the right kind of infrastructure, you couldn't be turning over $10 million. And look, you know, there, there's so many businesses here are really trying to grow and trying to get scale. You know, for some advisors, we know they, they don't necessarily want to take over the world. They, they're quite happy to have a small business. But I, I agree with Glenn. You know, you, it's one thing to have a small business, but if it's a single advisor practice, there are so many more challenges uh, on, on your shoulders. And, you know, those who are a single advisor practice listening to this right now, uh, if that's because you're a startup and you're growing and you're getting there, good on you out standing, keep growing. And if you, you're a single advisor practice and you've still been in that, that size for a long period of time, in fact, you may even not be listening to this podcast because what we find is they end up so busy, they're working 80 hours a week and they don't have time to scratch themselves, which means they don't have time to, to look at how they can do things better and how they can improve because it is really tough, right? Let alone the risk um, of, you know, if you can't turn up to work, you have to turn your fees off. But you know, don't be disheartened by this because there are absolutely opportunities, whether it be looking at rolling your business in with a, a larger business and, and owning part of, a, you know, this this behemoth that you can then tap into the scale and the things that they've built, or whether it be finding another advisor that's got similar values as you that really want to build a similar kind of outcome for your client. You know, it's it's not it's not the end if this is just you with one advisor in a practice. Look at the different alternatives you've got to be able to keep doing what you do really well. And look, um, with the Ensemble app in your pocket <laughs> at all times, you're never alone. That's true. You're never alone. You know, um, uh, when I scroll through the feed, 
um, of, of questions and answers. Some are very technical. Um, but there's a lot that are very much, you just get the vibe that there are uh, smaller practices. And the best thing is some of them are good givers mm. and then they get much in res- return. So there is a way of scaffolding yeah, of, that's of, right. of, of that bridge. Yeah, you know, it and, can be lonely, but yeah. you've got community there. Yeah, that's right. And, and the businesses that we're focused on, they've all taken that next step. They've all brought their people through. Um, they've all, dare I say, scaled up. Um, a little bit in their own, way, you know, particular way. In fact, some of them have turbocharged. Mm-hmm. Um, they've all probably, you know, what's the difference between a, a, a buying a job and having a business? It's probably a few things, but I reckon when you borrow and you have to sign a director's <laughs> guarantee, I reckon you've got yourself a business there. And if you don't know you've got a business, then your uh, significant other will tell you. Yeah, so, this is um, true. But this is the whole purpose of this podcast, isn't it? And I love, I love, love, love that you are doing this because looking at the engine room of these firms, this is how we learn from one another and how people can get those great ideas and take them into their own space and, and keep growing this awesome profession. And speaking of engine rooms, Sue, you've been doing this for a while. Um, can I ask you uh, one thing? What's what's news with uh, Alexa and, <laughs> and what's your take on uh, the engine rooms? Because you're about to fly over the Nullarbor and I may not physically see you for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, I think as this episode drops, it will be out in the marketplace. We will have announced that uh, Alexa has merged in with VBP. Congratulations. Thank you. And I suppose more than that, why? Well, Roxy, I've been running Alexa for 16 years now and I've always been driven by this passion and and so too have my coaches, this passion to support advisors to build better businesses. And there's a couple of reasons why this partnership makes a lot of sense to us, in part because it can get really frustrating when we're helping firms, we're working from a strategy level, we're coaching them, we're keeping them accountable, but the great ideas that they have either don't get implemented or they take too long to get implemented because they don't have the execution capacity. I I literally, one of the other co-hosts I have, Dean Holmes, who also helps me unpack, he sings from exactly the same hymn book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have the ideas. And for a lot of firms, they are successful, but they may not necessarily have um, the long-term need or the spare cash flow to put on a permanent resource to be able to run projects. And and certainly the expertise that you might need to run the different projects that you want to have, you can't get that all in one person. So we developed the GSD Lab um, a couple of years ago, uh, and shout out to my colleague Lana Clark, who's that. That was her brainchild. Um, and GSD, c- can I? T- can you? Um, yeah, you, you you can definitely uh, provi- provided that. It, um, uh, well, how far is this going from the law? <laughs> It's no, it's called the getting something done. Is that right? Getting what done? It is. Look, it depends on who we're speaking to. The The origin of it is it's getting shit done. Nice. Uh, because this is about let's stop thinking about high-level stuff. Let's stop thinking airy-fairy. At the end of the day, you've got to get shit done or you're not going to move your business forward. But if people are offended by that, it could be get stuff done. Uh, but the reality is in order for us to really help people get shit done in the best way possible is there are better resources that you can utilize that aren't necessarily onshore. So, of course, VB have got these fantastic team of people uh, 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 in the Philippines um, and they are going to be able to really turbocharge that service for us and for us internally as well. You know, we've got some awesome things that we're bringing to market, but when we're such a small team here in Australia, it was difficult for me to scale up, you know, talking about the capital backing behind us. You know, I had a few opportunities on the table. Uh, so it's one thing about having the money behind you to be able to fund this, but then to have the infrastructure and a team there, you know, for, for Do you feel like you're having the conversation now that we just reviewed some of the practices yes. going through that yes, same I journey? Yeah. You know, where now you're in the position where you can bring employee share schemes or team yes. member share schemes that you can you you can make sure you can have holidays that you know, like isn't it just yeah, so it's, serendipitous? It is. And and I must say that that there are plenty of plenty of really respected uh, other other organisations like VBP, mm. you know, as part of the Ethical Outsourcing Association yeah. that provide this scaffolding for lots of other organisations. Mm. Um, well, um, we're really pumped 
um, uh, to have uh, such great insights on the engine room. Um, and, yeah, so over to you. Yeah. Oh, look, I, thanks. I, I, it's really exciting what we're going to bring to market and what we're going to be doing. It, it's To be honest, when – VBP first reached out to me, it, it, I kind of questioned it because it didn't really make immediate sense to me. You know, hang on, you you guys do outsourcing in the Philippines. That's very different to what we do. But when I looked a little bit further, we actually have the same, it's pretty much slightly different words, but the same purpose. We are two companies that are driven to support advisors to run better advice practices. And so we put the the power of these two businesses together. Uh, we can help advisors with strategy. We can help them define what they're trying to achieve with their business. We can power that with fantastic people. And of course, my first thing was really I needed to understand the values of this business. It's, you know, I talk to my clients all the time. Whenever we're helping people pursue a merger opportunity or a growth opportunity, the first thing you have to get right is make sure you've got cultural alignment and shared values. And, you know, thankfully, I actually went up a couple of times to the Cebu offices because, you know, I needed to make sure this wasn't just a firm that was exploiting Filipinos. And I know you're involved, so, you know, I'm sorry if that offends you, but that was a thought process that went through my mind. I needed to know that, you know, all the things that I was hearing and you were telling me was actually true. And, and I'm so thrilled to say that they absolutely are. And, and I'm just oh, I'm so excited about what we're going to do with this. And you know what? Uh, what a great way to frame a podcast that's completely devoted to the business of the business and financial advice. I'd like to thank you, congratulate you, and thank you for sharing um, some time with me today in unpacking those wonderful practices. Um, I'd like to shout out to all the practices that have been on the podcast. Yeah. If you're a listener and you're part of a practice and you go, geez, I tell you what, we should be on that podcast, you know where I'm at. <laughs> Reach out. I want to talk to as many positive, enthusiastic beacons for engine rooms in Australia. With that, I'd like to thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sound guy, Kieran, as always. Yep, that's that's him nodding. Yes. Um, and um, <laughs> to everyone else, um, have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.